Sometimes people get the strangest ideas about life. You know, the life we're living, the life that we right now are participating in. You know, breathing and eating and drinking and having our enjoyment of those particularly things that we like to do. I don't know about you, but quite frankly, I've been noticing that a lot of my friends are dying. <laughs> well, okay, maybe not my friends, but people that I know in the faith, you know, like Ron Graham or, you know, some other people, uh, I can't even think of their names right now, but there was like, must have been five or six well-known Christian writers that have been on the internet for a long time that died in 2013. And I was surprised in a way and not sorrowful in another way because you see I'm not the best person to have around when it comes to dying. I kind of enjoy it. <laughs> I you know I figure well, you know, you had your choice, you know, you either kind of you made the right choice or you made the wrong choice and you figure that one out when you died. And you move on to whatever you're going to experience, whether eternal damnation or eternal reward, so to speak. Because the reality of life that we're living now is passing away. It's not meant to be the end result of everything you've ever dreamed of or wanted or got. This is nothing compared to what we're getting ready for, and that's eternity. And so, I'm not really the kind of guy that, you know, you want around at a funeral. Because, you know, I may say some nice things, you know, and I may be able to comfort you, you know, and pray with you and to encourage you in a lot of ways. But funerals are for the living, not the dying. I mean, the dead are already there. <laughs> Jesus said it best, you know, he kind of had this expression. Let me move something real quick. There's a flapping going on behind my camera. I figure, well... That's probably going to interrupt. But Jesus had an interesting expression. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Because in his day, they made dying a big deal. You know, big funerals, celebrations. You know, you had to take care of the property. You know, and then you had to go before the court and get that solved. And then you had to, you know, make sure that, you know, everybody was getting their inheritance and all those other things. You know, test dates and, you know setting up trust funds and all that kind of junk. Junk. But Jesus said, you know, when it came to following him, let the dead bury the dead. Because really, anything that comes between you and your relationship with God, it's a waste of time. It really is. And so, I took that attitude maybe too far. I personally don't react much to death and dying. I kind of dealt with it a lot in my personal life and been involved in it with a lot of my life and everywhere around me people seem to be dying <laughs> well what are you gonna do go to hell and witness to them <laughs> or heaven and you know congratulate them no so I kinda don't deal with death the same way most people do it somebody said you know well you must compartmentalize I said no not really I said I just pretty much take it reality <laughs> it's part of my life it's like, I don't see death as an end, so maybe that's why I just look at it as it where it begins. And that's where people <coughs> make the mistake about this life. They get so wrapped up in thinking this is all there is, they don't realize there's more to life than living. Dying. <laughs> that's the beginning of life. At least eternal life. And I can't wait. Now, I always told somebody, you know, a long time ago until I realized how serious people get about some of the words you say that I had to be careful now what I say. But I used to tell people, you know, if I could get away with it, you know, man, dying seems like a good way to go to get on with it. I said, now the camera's got it. I got this thing messed up. have to get this plastic piece behind it out of the way. I have gardening things going on all the time, so my camera, when I move it around, gets affected. But in the knowledge that we are going to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, 
you realize that once you know where you're going to go, this life is just kind of like not so important as the life to come. And so I find it interesting that a lot of times people get, you know, like caught up into this world and its ways. They get caught up into this life and its, its momentary pleasures. They get their flesh involved and they live after their flesh, you know, buying little things for themselves to participate in the world. Oh, I didn't have one when I was a kid, but now I can go get one. Oh, I didn't have a chance to buy this, this secular music, so now I'm going to go listen to secular music. Oh, I didn't have a Harley growing up, so now I'm going to go buy a Harley. Oh, now that I've got money, I'm going to go... Excuse me? You know, be thankful for what God has blessed you with, but no offense, I don't want to let my flesh be subject to any of these passions or lusts thereof that would catch me up and get me caught up into what they do and what it is. Because, you see, there are times where you can talk to people, Christians, and say, oh, the Lord's coming back. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. But then you talk to them when their first child is born. Well, you know, the Lord's coming back sooner or later, but just not now. Okay. Well, you know, then they, the child takes their first steps and begins to walk. And you go, well, you know, the Lord's coming back, but, you know, maybe down the road, but not, not at our generation. Well, maybe in our generation. We should always look for him, of course. You know, we don't, we don't want to get too pushy about that because, you know, Lord, please don't come back. You know, I want to see my children grow up. I, quite frankly, think that's the most disgusting thought I could imagine. How gross it would be to think that your children are going to grow up in this society. Ugh. <laughs> Man, what a scary thought to grow up as a generation prepared for Armageddon, prepared to go to war and die for their country, prepared to give up their life for meaningless, issueless reasons that have nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, and to be misled and deceived by the world and its ways and the things that are coming upon the world, the great deception, the great you know, persecution that's going to happen to think that you want to see your children grow up in this time? You know, Jesus had an interesting way of putting it. He told those that were in Jerusalem, Whoa! Take a step back. Take a look. That's what whoa means. In case you didn't know, whoa unto you means whoa, back up, Jack. Take a look again what it's saying. Woe unto you. Oh, how sad it is for you that have babies in those days. Oh, how miserable it will be for you to have children in those days. Because in those days, you'll watch them being tortured in front of you. You'll watch them choosing even worse to go to hell than to go to heaven. You know, I hear it all the time. And I'm fascinated by it. You know, people tell me, you know, when you're a parent, you know, it's different. You know, you gotta, you love your children no matter what. So if my child chooses, you know, to have a gay lifestyle, you know, well, you know, I, I, I don't accept their lifestyle, but, you know, I love them anyways. Well, that's nice. Did you tell them they're going to hell? <laughs> Unless they change their ways, except Jesus? Because quite frankly, any man that loves their children or their mother loves their daughter more than they love Jesus aren't worthy to be called his disciples. That's what Jesus said. You can tell me all day long about how much you love your children, but unless you put your children in a proper place, you're going to find yourself with God in your face. That's just the way it is. But you see, if you do put God in his place, God may give you back your children in his timing and in his way. Because the children really aren't your own. Though they may have come out of your loins, they're only loaned to you for a season to raise them up in the way of the Lord because if you don't, their blood are in your hands because you've been told to train them up in the way that they should go and when they're old they will not depart so that they may go on a side trip for a while but God knows if he's committed them unto himself and he's inscribed them in the book of life, they will eventually come to him and have eternal life. But the reality of life itself needs to be examined in the perspective of death. Death is not the end of the world. It's not the end of your existence. It's merely the transition from the physical plane to the spiritual plane. You're moving from 
the death of the flesh to the life of the spirit. And that's what you should be living already, now. Living after the things of the spirit and not the things of the flesh. And that's where I wonder what people are doing today. Are they living after and led by the spirit of God? Or are they living according to the flesh and after the things of the flesh? What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. The law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto too perfect. They can't be. They never will be. The law cannot make anyone perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered if they were perfect? They would not have to do it year after year? By him all that you all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Because of belief in Jesus Christ, we are justified, which the law of Moses could never do, but the law of God has done for us. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. In the same way that children are your flesh and blood, the same way we who are of Jesus are of his flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them through fear of death, where all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Interesting that the fear of death is of the devil. It is something that people fear because they don't know what God has done or created death to be. So when Jesus died, he took away the sting of death. He says, O oh death, where is thy sting? You know, it has been swallowed up in victory in that with which Jesus has done for all of us on the cross and by the resurrection from the dead of Jesus so that it would be a demonstration to all of heaven as well as to earth and to us who believe so that we know that when we die we would have a resurrection and that we would be likened unto Jesus the same way in that if we believe in him we have the same as he has because even as you have a mother and father and you are the same flesh and genetic makeup so too if you were born again of the spirit then of the same spirit genetic spiritual makeup you are of that same nature and that nature being of Jesus the godliness that God has in him that by way of the Holy Spirit you have in you. And so the reality of our life begins at death, though we exist now in part by walking in the Spirit and of the Spirit being led. So those that do so no longer sin or choose to sin or choose to be a part of this world and involved in the world but rather are passing through as sojourners in a strange and foreign land that they no longer belong to because their citizenship is of heaven. And they have a purpose here and a reason for living that goes beyond the simple existence of raising children, eating and drinking, enjoying the lusts of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eye, and participating in things that acting like the world, they become as the world, and they no longer are effective to the world, and they no longer affected effective for the world. But rather, the world has infected them with its own worldliness, and they have lost the nature of godliness, because God is no longer the focal point of the primacy of their life. What is the direction of your life today? Are you wrapped up in the world and its ways, and caught up in the things to do today? Or are you living your life according to the will of God that he has chosen to direct you even though you are living in those circumstances that you're in, whether it be a, a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief, a soldier, you know, prophet, priest, king, whatever. Are you using those places and times and things for the kingdom of heaven to preach the gospel, to teach, to, re re to relate the very personal nature of God himself? in the form of a relationship with Jesus so that they can know him in a personal, intimate way? Or are you just wasting God's time and your own, living out a life that God has let you go ahead and accumulate to yourself the boys, the toys, the girls, the games, the plays, the selfishness, the selfish desires 
so that you've accumulated a kingdom that's going to perish and that you sacrificed your soul and forfeited your spirit for your flesh and the things of the world. God help you. The reason I say that is because when you die, you'll take nothing with you but what you put in you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things would be added unto you. But lay for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust does not corrupt, but they shall live eternally. And those treasures will accompany you into heaven as you go there to be with the Lord. Because you will die. It's a fact. You will die. And the reality of death had better be part of your living experience, or you're wasting those people's lives around you as you become a liability rather than an asset to God.